Welcome to the Kotki Ride Home for Friday, April 2nd, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. It turns out we got lucky with how quickly the Ever Given was freed. The last time the Suez Canal was blocked, it dragged on for eight years and led to the creation of a micronation at sea with a separate postal service and even their own Olympic Games. How Finland celebrates Easter with trick-or-treating and Easter witches. NASA's InSight lander has observed two strong Mars quakes recently, helping us measure the planet's core. But what are quakes like on a planet without tectonic plates? Here are some of the cool things from the news today. After being stuck for six days, the Ever Given was finally freed from the Suez Canal on Tuesday, but the fallout from blocking global traffic for almost a whole week will continue to be felt for quite some time to come. First, there were hundreds of vessels backed up behind the Ever Given, and it's been taking them days to all get through, not to mention all of the others who decided to change course and go around the Cape of Good Hope, adding thousands of nautical miles to their journeys, and all of those delays cost money. Ports are also bracing themselves for a flood of vessels all arriving at once on top of regular traffic, and all of this just adds to the strains that were already on the global shipping economy from disrupted supply chains and shipping container shortages, consequences of both the pandemic and inclement weather in various parts of the world. The Wall Street Journal notes that exporters and importers are looking at insurance claims totaling in the billions of dollars. Otto Schacht, the executive vice president for sea logistics at Quinn and Nagel International AG, said it could be until mid-June before the carefully choreographed schedule of container ships gets back on track. So even though we may be feeling the ramifications of the ever-given blockade for many months to come, at least the canal wasn't blocked for eight years like it was in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, Eight years. From 1967 to 1975, 14 cargo ships were stuck in the Bitter Lake, a particularly salty lake that feeds into the canal. And unlike the sandstorm-fueled physics problem of last week, these ships were stuck in the middle of a war. Instead of memes, the incident spawned its own micronation at sea, a maritime community that eventually formed their own postal service with their own stamps and even held their own Olympics just before the global ones in 1968. Due to how their ships appeared from afar coated with desert sand, they became known in the press as the Yellow Fleet. Quoting Vice, The trouble began in June 1967. Egypt and Israel went to war in what's now called the Six-Day War, and though that specific conflict only lasted six days, the fallout from it would stretch on for decades. Peter Flack was serving as the third mate on the British ship the MS Agapenor. The captain, communicating by pipe and whistle, called up to tell me he'd just heard that war had broken out between Israel and the Arab states, Flack told author Kath Senker for the book Stranded in the Six-Day War. If you see anything unusual, please let me know, but don't tell the Egyptian pilot. As part of the conflict, Egypt blockaded the Suez Canal. It blocked both ends of the canal with scuttled ships, debris, and sea mines to prevent its use by Israeli forces. The Agapenor and other ships sailing from West Germany, Sweden, France, the United Kingdom, Poland, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, and the United States were stranded. The ships floated in the canal and watched the war unfold around them. End quote. At first, the crews were able to use radios and call home, but the Egyptian forces eventually made them stop. And they were able to cycle out crew members and supplies, so some people did get to go home. But without being allowed to sail out of the lake, and without the ease of connection we have nowadays, the crews of those 14 ships were essentially cut off from the rest of the world. It didn't take long before the crews from various nations started communicating with one another, partially out of necessity and partially out of boredom. Quoting a Time article that Vice pulled from 1969, To while away the time, they take part in lifeboat races and play soccer on the broad deck of the largest ship, the British bulk carrier Invercargill. They attend church services on the West Germany motorship Nordwind and watch movies on the Bulgarian freighter Vasilevsky. 
The Polish writer Jakarta even prints stamps for the marooned vessels. Egyptian postal authorities graciously allowed the stamps to be used as legal postage. They have become collector's items. Immense amounts of beer are consumed in the heat, says one crewman. There must be five feet worth of beer bottles on the bottom around each hole by now. End quote. All of that beer, other food, and the original stamps were pooled as resources as part of their newly created Great Bitter Lake Association, or GBLA, which was formed to take care of one another's needs. Quoting again from Vice, In addition to stamps, the sailors created dinnerware and patches to show their association with the GBLA. In 1968, the GBLA ran its own Olympic Games 10 days ahead of the real thing. The crews competed in 14 events, including diving, sprinting, high jump, archery, and water polo. Polish crews even minted medals to hand out at an awards ceremony. A soccer-playing dog named Bulbul participated in the Games and was awarded a medal. End quote. While the crew continued on well enough over those eight years, by the time Egypt lifted the blockade in 1975, only two of the ships were in good enough condition to sail away on their own. Interestingly, Vice notes that this eight-year blockade had direct impacts that led to the Ever Given situation. They quoted the Six-Day War book by Kath Senker, up until the Six-Day War, the size of the tankers was limited so that they could go through the canal. The largest to go through was a 150,000 deadweight tonnage Norwegian tanker. After the canal closed, there was an almost overnight demand for a 25% increase in oil tanker capacity. The shipping companies began to build ever bigger super tankers, and there was an explosive growth of merchant fleets. End quote. Ever Given is 220,000 tons and one of the class of supertankers created after the Six-Day War blockade. So while it's a good thing that the blockade didn't last nearly as long this time, it's also kind of because of the first one that this one happened. But as for the crews who were stuck in the blockade in the 60s and 70s, they still meet up from time to time, and many of them consider it the happiest period of their lives. And if you want to see a few of them recount the experience in their own words, Al Jazeera produced a documentary about the Yellow Fleet a couple years ago that I will put a link to in the show notes. It's Easter weekend, and despite whatever traditions your family may have if they celebrate, I can almost guarantee that they aren't as cool as what some folks get up to in Finland, where Easter is almost like a second Halloween, but more cottagecore. A lot of the traditions are rooted in the changing of the season, blending ancient traditions celebrating the arrival of spring with some more traditional religious rites. For example, quoting Finland's Ministry for Foreign Affairs magazine, This is Finland, As Easter approaches, Finnish children plant grass seeds in shallow dishes of soil and place birch twigs in vases of water and watch eagerly for green shoots and mouse ear buds to appear, symbolizing the springtime reawakening of life. End quote. Pretty innocuous, but then there's this, quoting again, in the most popular family tradition, young children, especially girls, dress up as Easter witches, donning colorful old clothes and painting freckles on their faces. The little witches then go from door to door, bringing willow twigs decorated with colorful feathers and crepe paper as blessings to drive away evil spirits, in return for treats, says children's culture expert Rili Karamaki of the Pesi Children's Art Center in Venta, just north of Helsinki. Like many Finnish householders, Karamaki keeps a basket of small chocolate Easter eggs ready by the door to pay off the marauding witches. Other families reward them with sweets or small change, or keep their front doors resolutely closed. End quote. And instead of saying trick or treat, the little witches recite a traditional Finnish rhyme, which translated says roughly, I wave a twig for a fresh and healthy year ahead, a twig for you, a treat for me. End quote. The origins of this tradition come from two different sources. Karamaki says, quote, A Russian Orthodox ritual where birch twigs originally represented the palms laid down when Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and a Swedish and Western Finnish tradition in which children made fun of earlier fears that evil witches could be about on Easter Saturday. End quote. And due to these dual origins, the custom is sometimes performed on Palm Sunday in some parts of the country while on Easter Sunday in others. 
Now, as far as the religious side of things go, Iris Kivamaki of the Evangelical Lutheran Church Communications Center says evening mass on Monday, Thursday is one of the biggest church events of the year. Increasingly, followed by passion plays performed on Good Friday. The one in Helsinki's Senate Square is usually attended by about 15,000 people. And then on Easter Saturday, many villages erect enormous bonfires to ward away evil spirits. Or, you know, really just to have a fun evening together, but the origins are in warding off evil spirits. Decorating eggs is fun and all, but you know, I think a big town bonfire the night before Easter sounds like an awesome tradition. Maybe it's time we adopt some of Finland's Easter customs on this side of the pond. NASA has reported that in March, their InSight lander detected two strong, clear Mars quakes with magnitudes of 3.3 and 3.1. In total, InSight has recorded over 500 Mars quakes, but most of them are pretty small. These two larger ones originated in the same location, Cerberus Fosse, as two other large Mars quakes earlier in InSight's mission. In total, those four Mars quakes comprise the best samples we have for learning more about Mars's interior, specifically with regards to the planet's mantle and core. Earlier last month, InSight measured Mars's core for the very first time, and it turns out it's even bigger than we thought it would be, but also less dense. Quoting Sci-Fi, Based on InSight's seismographic instruments, which interpret seismic waves bounced between the planet's mantle and core, the radius of the red planet's heart was found to be 1,810 to 1,860 kilometers, approximately half the size of Earth's. According to the NASA team's research, the core is far less dense than predicted, and is theorized to be made up of lighter elements like oxygen blended with a predominance of iron and sulfur. InSight's new measurements will aid scientists' understanding of Mars's formation and evolution and help explain how its dense, metal-rich core divided from the surrounding rocky mantle as the planet cooled. This fiery core is likely to be still molten from Mars's genesis four and a half billion years ago. The mission's seismic data also predicts that Mars's upper mantle, a region extending from 700 to 800 kilometers below the surface, is infused with a dense zone of thickened material in which deep-traveling seismic energy is found to travel with reduced velocity. End quote. The only other cores that have been measured are the Earth's and our moons, so it's pretty cool to have this information, and it's thanks to InSight's seismic readings that we do. So these recent strong and clearly detected Mars quakes are really a big deal. Mars quakes aren't exactly like earthquakes, however. Mars doesn't have tectonic plates, but it does have volcanically active regions which produce what scientists call the Mars quakes. Quoting from NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, over the course of the mission, we've seen two different types of Mars quakes, one that is more moon-like and the other more Earth-like, said Taiichi Kawamara of France's Institut de Physique du Globe de Paris, which helped provide InSight's seismometer and distributes its data along with the Swiss Research University ETH Zurich. Earthquake waves travel more directly through the planet, while those of moon quakes tend to be very scattered. Mars quakes fall somewhere in between. Interestingly, Kawamura continued, all four of these larger quakes, which come from Cerberus Fosse, are Earth-like. The new quakes have something else in common with InSight's previous top seismic events, which occurred almost a full Martian year ago, two Earth years. They occurred in the Martian northern summer. Scientists had predicted this would again be an ideal time to listen for quakes because winds would become calmer. The seismometer, called the Seismic Experiment for Interior Structure, or SEIS, is sensitive enough that even while it's covered by a dome-shaped shield to block it from wind and keep it from getting too cold, wind still causes enough vibration to obscure some Mars quakes. During the past northern winter season, InSight couldn't detect any quakes at all. End quote. They're also fighting against the extreme swing in temperatures, which can cause the cable running between the lander and the seismometer to pop as it expands and contracts, as well as losing solar power as Mars moves away from the sun. Once winter hits on Mars, InSight will go into hibernation to conserve power. And if you want to see InSight in action, including some of the methods that it's developed to work against those obstacles, the lander has been tweeting out GIFs of its work on its original Twitter page, link in the show notes. Thank you. 
So apparently, instead of finishing The Winds of Winter, George R.R. R. Martin has been at work on a stage play of The Game of Thrones, being developed for Broadway, The West End, as well as in Australia. Unlike the various prequel projects in the works, or the weird time-traveling Harry Potter play, the Game of Thrones play is expected to star many major characters from the Song of Ice and Fire book series and HBO adaptation, and be based around an event that occurred just 16 years before the first book is set, the Grand Tourney at Harrenhal, a pivotal event in Westeros history. The first show is expected to open in 2023. Tangentially related, George R.R. R. Martin is an investor and sometimes creative collaborator for an arts collective based out of Santa Fe, New Mexico called Meow Wolf. In Santa Fe, they bought out a bowling alley and turned it into a giant, immersive, surrealist experience called The House of Eternal Return, where you walk through the story discovering portals and other mind-bending architectural tricks all tripped out in neon colors and abstract decor. Their second permanent installation recently opened in Las Vegas. It's called Omega Mart, and it's a similar experience, but themed after a supermarket. They produced a series of fake commercials that are kind of like a cross between that Welcome to Night Vale podcast and Stranger Things. One of them even stars Willie Nelson, maybe. Definitely worth a watch. I'll put a link to those videos in the show notes. But if you want to see real actual corporate outposts in surreal seeming environments, you should also check out the Twitter non-standard McDonald's, which shares photos from around the world of fast food chain restaurants built into unexpected locations, like an Art Deco McDonald's, several castle locations, and the combination KFC Pizza Hut at the Pyramids of Giza. As the account bio says, quote, Preserving the only architectural heritage of the Western world, end quote, which, oof. But that is it for this week. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again on Monday.